know it's his fault, Gordon, if you have to wait for the picture. Yeah, I think <laughs> I have the camera up there. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, analysis preservation and systematic manifestation, but then Atlas sort of tells us a little bit two pieces, like how we do analysis preservation that we use that for reinterpretation. Just for motivation, of course, we all know now that we completed the standard model with the Higgs, the BSM program of the LHC is uh, even a higher priority, and Atlas is producing a ton, ton of results. Like we have a lot of limits and a lot of exclusion contours, and we had a 750 GV bump that came and went away, and so far we haven't really found anything significant. So the question is where the new physics is hiding, and so it might hide in unexpected places. You know, maybe there's compressed models or models spread, uh, spreading across many topologies, or it might not be reachable by the LHC at all. So the question uh, kind of uh, becomes how do we exploit the LHC data to maximize our understanding of the model landscape, so which models are still in the running, which models are excluded, and the problem, of course, here is that we have many, many more candidate models than we have graduate students to uh, design dedicated analysis. So we could maybe turn this thing a little bit around and kind of try to uh, make the most of the analysis that we do have. And so the answer to the question could be that we should be leveraging modern analysis preservation and reusability uh, techniques to reinterpret the existing analysis with respect to multiple uh, models, because actually many of the analysis that we're designing are sensitive to a whole range of physics models. So uh, if we look at a typical uh, analysis, so most of the work actually goes into taking the data, you know, uh, sitting in a control room, designing the experiment, uh, designing the analysis, understanding the standard model background, and then the model interpretation really comes at the very end, and it's in some sense technically the easiest part, right? So the analysis pipeline is fixed by then, all the cuts are fixed, um, we unblinded our data, the Monte Carlo data set sizes are usually pretty small, something like 50 to 100,000 events. And analysis teams actually already uh, routinely check hundreds of parameter points, right? So usually you have something like a two-dimensional grid and hundreds of points that actually are one model each. And so analysis teams already do that, but the problem is they check like one class of model, and then they stop, and then they publish their paper, and then they're done. So reinterpreting or recasting kind of is this idea of predicting new uh, BSM contributions uh, under the given analysis and then rerunning the analysis, uh, the statistical evaluation uh, for the same uh, data and background estimate as the original analysis and kind of uh, getting deriving new limits for that new model uh, once you have that uh, analysis archive. So in this uh, little cartoon where you have your background estimates and your data and then you have your single contribution in red, the idea is to switch out to a new single contribution, you keep the data and the background fixed, and then you rerun the, your statistical evaluation and get a new limit for that new model. And so, how do you do a reinterpretation? The reinterpretation actually is a very straightforward uh, recipe with uh, kind of three ingredients. So you have your model, and so what you need to do is you need to kind of generate your new signal, and then run it through the analysis pipeline, through the event selection, and then run the uh, statistical evaluation where you pair that uh, new single contribution with the data and the background to derive a new limit. And so uh, what do you need to be able to do that? So you need to, the ability to generate a new signal, including access to the detector simulation and reconstruction, uh, access to analysis and event selection logic, and then you need access to the data and background estimates. So I said access a lot, and so that kind of tells you that uh, the true implementation of this recipe only uh, is really uh, doable by the co collaborations themselves, right, because only they have access to all these things. And uh, but uh, so now we didn't have an efficient way to do this, and this is why an entire ecosystem of tools developed outside of the collaborations to, you know, have an approximate implementation of the recipe. And so there are tools like Checkmate, Adam, et cetera, that try to do this. And so why have uh, experiments or collaborations not been able to do this efficiently themselves? And so the, the bottleneck is not really the signal generation because Atlas has a well-managed uh, kind of standardized process to generate new signals, so anybody can do it, and a lot of people do it. And so this is really not the bottleneck. The most challenging aspect here is uh, the preservation of that uh, event selection and statistical evaluation. So and this is what we usually call uh, analysis preservation. And so the message here is that if we can solve analysis preservation and uh, analysis reusability, that kind of enables us to very efficiently run these reinterpretations as a collaboration. And so 
In this recipe, you have two pieces usually, so one is model dependent and one is analysis dependent. So if you preserve the analysis, that allows us, that doesn't really depend on the model, so that allows you to, to uh, rerun any model through that analysis once you have that preserved. Um, so why have we not, or why is this analysis preservation hard? So we talked a little bit about this today in the plenary. Um, so, you know, so one thing is you need to preserve the analysis not in like some kind of metadata way of who was involved in the analysis. You need to uh, preserve it operationally so that you can actually rerun the analysis code on your input. And then Atlas analysis are quite complex, right? It's not like a single file that you write in the framework, like a checkmate or a rivet, where it usually is a single file. But there's uh, lots of shared libraries involved, and uh, the code is very diverse. There are many frameworks that are not using the same framework. And a lot of like little scripts running around, and then we have some sociolo sociological problem where we have distributed teams, distributed code, distributed data, and so one person is actually rarely able to run the entire analysis. So typically, you have one person developing event selection, and another person is doing background estimation, another person yet is doing the significant analysis, and then somehow all these pieces get uh, strung together into an analysis workflow. So if you want to preserve this, we can't really force people to you know, change the way they're working, so they uh, Goal should really be to kind of develop a tool chain to capture what people are already doing and basically adapt to them instead of forcing people to kind of uh, adapt to your goal of preserving the analysis. And so you need to do two things. You need to capture the software, like for each little step, the event selection, the statistical evaluation, you need to capture the code that actually does that step. And then in the second step, you need to kind of capture the logic, how to string these pieces together into an analysis workflow to actually go from the input all the way to the limit uh, that you want in the end. And so the software capture, this, this first part, the software capture was really intractable until recently. There was always this abstract idea that you could do it in principle using virtual machines, and that was uh, not wrong, right? So we could have done that, but virtual machines are uh, kind of cumbersome to deal with, and so we didn't really do this ever, right? And so uh, in recent years, there was a lot of progress in the IT industry to kind of move to these uh, new technology of Linux containers. And so this Linux uh, new technology has very wide industry support. So we're kind of very, uh, feel very good about uh, them staying around for the foreseeable future. And this really revolutionized software distribution and archival in the industry. So this is the way that people deploy applications in the cloud. And it kind of has a generic app store feel to it. And, a lot of buy-in from many uh, big companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft. So this is a good technology to choose. And now they're also becoming a major topic in the LHC collaborations, not only for analysis preservation, but also for you know how do we run our grid or distributed computing. And this is simplified a lot of what goes into running a grid site, et cetera. So the message here is basically that the technology stack to actually enable realistic software capture and analysis preservation has only really become available quite recently. And once it was available, we really jumped on it very quickly and have uh, seen very good results uh, using these technologies. And so there are a lot of the logos here. And so this is all the different pieces of technologies that we're uh, using in analysis preservation. So how do we actually get these uh, Linux containers of you know, actual LHC uh, analysis software or Atlas software, you know, collaboration software? So there's a centralized effort in Atlas to build by the software infrastructure team to build these uh, base images that actually have a collaboration software installed in them. And there are like two uh, generic ways how to do it. So there's a poster by Marcelo, so maybe you've seen that in the poster session. So either you can kind of uh, only have a bare bones operating system and then rely on CBFS where all of our software usually lie on. Right, but it's not everything on CBFS, so you need the kind of the base operating system that is compatible with that. Or you can actually install the uh, collaboration software in the Docker image, and this kind of has the benefit that you don't depend on CMFS, so you can actually run it in the cloud where on a host where that doesn't know anything about client physics, which is also nice because you're losing one dependency, which is always good. And so the thing that we gain from uh, having this uh, central uh, process of building base images inside of the collaboration is that. The first thing we gain is just software preservation for the common atlas workloads, like running reconstruction. This is all the code you need to run reconstruction, right? And it also uh, provides an easy to use base image on top of which you can build as a user so that you don't need to start from scratch from some 
we are going to do installation to preserve your analysis. So like 90% of the analysis preservation work is already uh, done for you. So th this is basically where we start, but then the crucial part is of course that we need to get the analysis uh, code into the container. And obviously not everybody will become a container expert, so we need to make it as streamlined as possible to kind of capture the user analysis code into these Linux containers. And it should happen in the background without the user having to do anything. And so what we're uh, exploiting is that there's an increased use of uh, the GitLab installation that we have at CERN to uh, kind of have our and manage our uh, analysis code. And so GitLab has two nice features. It has a uh, Docker registry where you can store Docker images. And it has a continuous integration facility where you can run uh, kind of a regular job each time you commit code to uh, this repository. And so what we're doing and what we've developed is the way that each time the user you know, make the change in their analysis code, the job in the background starts to build the Docker image and then store it in the Docker registry that GitLab already provides. So uh, this means that we can kind of capture the analysis software during development time. And we don't need to kind of ask people after the publication of the analysis, okay, now preserve your analysis because nobody wants to do that after the publication, they want to move on to the next analysis, right? And so we made it very easy. You only have to write a couple of lines of code, how to compile your uh, code in question, right? So, you know, you'll usually uh, check out some packages and then you'll compile your code and then this will all be packaged up into a Docker image and then uh, be available in the GitLab interface. So that's the first part of uh, capturing the software environment. And then the second part is how do you capture the logic? You know, what uh, steps do you need to run in what order? So first you need to run the event selection, then you need to run the uh, statistical analysis. Uh, and then so for that we developed a declarative workflow language called Gadget, which is kind of based on ubiquitous industry standards like JSON and YAML. And it, this kind of is a text file way to describe the logic between the individual analysis steps. So first, so this is, I won't go through this example, but you have like two main stages. So this is an actual, you know, real world atlas analysis. And, you know, it starts with the event selection, which writes out the root file. Then uh, you have a fifth uh, stage where then you do the statistical uh, evaluation. So it's all quite readable, which is nice. And um, also it's machine readable, which is also nice. So the nice thing here, since it's a text page, you can just put that into the repository as well, and then you can actually develop this kind of text file during the analysis development. You don't need to like fill out the form at the end of uh, your analysis kind of life cycle. And so, which is also nice, it all goes into the same theme of making it as easy as possible to capture your analysis. And so, in the end, basically what we'll have, so we developed this in very close collaboration with the to an analysis preservation portal that we heard about in the uh, plenary. And basically this portal is uh, capable of storing code and software environments. So it will clone the repository, it will import the Docker image, it will kind of have the native support for the workflow specification and then ingest also data assets like if, uh, you know, the, the data and background estimates. And so you'll have a couple of text files, Docker images and data and background. So this will all go into here. So the next question is, so what? So we can capture all of these things and put them into the analysis preservation portal. What do you do with it once we have it? Here can we actually reuse it. And so this is what we heard about today. So this is like this generic workflow as a service platform uh, that we're developing at CERN. So the main unit of work is like this containerized workflow that is stored in the analysis preservation portal. And so uh, we're launching with uh, Yadish support uh, in the beginning, and now we're also exploring Chrome workflow language. And this is all deployed using modern cloud technologies on the CERN infrastructure, and it's also deployable on non-CERN infrastructure. And this is a joint effort between CERN IT, software, scientific information services, DASPOS, and Diana, and all these uh, things. And the idea is, okay, you have something in the portal, and then you'll be able to extract that and reuse that for uh, science. And so this gives you, like, you like, the basic capabilities, but it doesn't tell you like, which workflows you are interested in running. And so this is where Recast comes in, and this gives you like a semantic layer on top of this workflow service that kind of does encapsulate some kind of scientific question. So uh, the idea here is that, you know, this basic question of, okay, I have a model and I want to know whether or not that is excluded or not, that will not change, and you'll satisfy this interface using uh, this archive workflow, 
and this will allow you to produce reinterpretation on the same fidelity as original results, um, not only uh, approximations as with the third party uh, tools. And basically, there are two pieces uh, of this uh, kind of infrastructure for retest that has a front end where users can submit requests and kind of say, okay, these are the analysis that I want to have reinterpreted. And then there's this control center where we can view the request and actually then submit the processing of the analysis to this Rihanna backend. And so this is uh, what it looks like. So you can, so there are like command line tools, REST APIs, and all these things. And so you can import an analysis. You can request a new scan, and you'll kind of describe your scan also in the YAML file, and this will be uploaded to this front end. And then it will arrive at this uh, control center, and then you uh, kind of arrive at this thing that you need to process these requests. And there are various ways that we can process them. So either the request that is, uh, already comes you know, in the right format that is the input to the analysis, in that case, you will just run the analysis straight away. Or we still need to do the signal generation step. In that case, we can kind of combine multiple workflows uh, into a giant, uh, you know, more complex uh, workflow graph uh, dynamically. And so this is kind of an example of what it looks like. So let's say we have two workflows that do the uh, signal generation. So one workflow does the signal generation, one workflow does the analysis, and they are developed separately. What we can do is that we can combine these two things dynamically. We can see, okay, this is a signal generation workflow that produces a HEPMC file. This is the analysis that has been preserved and reads in the heaven seed file. We can combine these two things to kind of get this combined workflow to actually do this uh, basic interface where you run, uh, let's say, the single generation and then the analysis to get the limited result. And so this is what it looks like. So we also have a web interface here. Um, it just kind of shows you what uh, kind of processing capabilities you have. So there might be a way, multiple ways to kind of uh, you know, satisfy this request that people are making. And so we have uh, this web interface where we can see the status of the different uh, processing. So let's say that somebody came in with a request to do this two-dimensional reinterpretation in this uh, mass uh, plane. Uh, so we can uh, view all of these different points. The processing request so this kind of shows what the status of the point is. So some points are excluded, and some points are not excluded. And you'll basically see it already kind of make out what the contour, the new contour of that reinterpreted analysis is. So uh, it's also very uh, nice to monitor these things. So uh, once you submit this to the backend, to the workflow backend, you can see how this uh, workflow is being uh, you know, worked on. So there's uh, this graph of uh, workloads that you have. And then you can basically, this is all live updating and streaming. So you can like drill down to the individual nodes of the workflow. And this is all live updating. And so this is from the feeling uh, very similar to like your continuous integration infrastructure uh, that you have, like from Travis or GitLab. And so it kind of has interactive feel. It doesn't really feel like a black box because you see what's going on inside of the analysis. Um, so this brings me to my summary. So basically, within Atlas, we're kind of working towards increasing the implementation of this. So we have multiple examples inside of Atlas where we have these containerized workflows within both the SUSE and the exotic group. And there, the software is all captured with, uh, by a continuous integration. And then we have a, a Rihanna prototype deployed at CERN uh, with a you know, medium-sized cluster with a uh, thousand CPUs. So this allows us to run a large number of reinterpretations per day, even uh, what, assuming that we already have the signal generated. But we could also use this cluster to actually generate the signal using the full uh, detected simulation. Um, so that cluster is also big enough to do that. And so. A couple of words for future opportunities. So this is all inside of Atlas. So we uh, provide the service inside of Atlas. You need to be able to log in as an Atlas member and say, OK, I want to uh, do this request. You know, there's an Atlas analysis that I want to re reinterpret. But in principle, you know, if this kind of proves itself and uh, is robust enough, there's an opportunity to open this up to the wider hat community so that you know, people outside of the collaboration can kind of uh, put in new requests for reinterpretation. And this is kind of the vision where at some point we'll arrive that you know, theorists can come in and say, OK, I have a new idea. I have a new model that I want to reinterpret it. And then Atlas will kind of look at the request and see whether or not it's worth doing it. And if so, we run it on uh, using this archive uh, analysis that we have preserved 
and then go uh, publish the uh, result uh, back to the say have data or inspire. Um, so since this is a daycare and I couldn't uh, leave without machine learning, um, so if you think uh, of it as a on a very high level analysis preservation or this reinterpretation is a very very expensive multivariate function to evaluate, right? So you have a couple of masses in your math plane that you have as parameters, and then what you want is one uh, number like the CLS or the p-value to uh, tell you whether or not that point is excluded. And so usually we do two-dimensional grids of, you know, let's say 100 or so points. And the reason why we do this is fundamentally because it's very expensive. And if you want to do it in five dimensions, suddenly you go from 100 points to 100,000 points. And that's uh, super expensive because each of these points is like full simulation, uh, jammed, uh, and uh, reconstruction, uh, so that's super expensive. The question is, can we be a little bit smarter uh, and not do a grid search uh, of that space? Because a lot of these points are either completely not excluded or completely excluded, and so we're wasting CPU time evaluating these points. And so there's like a, a thing that we're working on, uh, which is a data optimization algorithm to smartly choose iteratively the points that you're evaluating. So, to, so that you get the best contour or the most accurate representation of the contour with the fewest points. Uh, and th this kind of scales also to multiple dimensions, so you can actually search high dimensional, uh, you know, parameter spaces using this kind of uh, algorithm. And so, but th this is only made possible if you are able to evaluate the function efficiently, which is basically what we can provide in, by using these automated workflows. Okay, that's basically it. Step kind of publishes the JSON document, right? And if there are a thousand files in the JSON document, you can basically, uh, I mean, that's not an issue place wise. And uh, basically, here is inside of this uh, representation is a, a kind of recipe how to go from these, how to schedule additional nodes in the workflow graph um, to kind of uh, get to the next step, right? So we'll take maybe these uh, thousand file names and then we'll schedule one. You know, event selection as a uh, job per file name. So if we have that in this file or is it auxiliary? No, I mean, but when you execute the workflow, uh, you know, uh, that JSON will at some point be published, right? And then uh, inside of here, so th this is not only like a string uh, and a single word, so it actually it's like a JSON path query. And so you can kind of drill down through the JSON and then get to all your file names that you need. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really fantastic, uh, this whole system. Um, but when we do, like, reinterpretation, or any exclusion limits, for interpretation, for that matter, um, the signal is not just a single number per mass point. We also have uncertainties on the signal. So it's not just, uh, uh, and that usually has to be done with it by hand, because you have to know, for a given signal, what the parameters are that were varying, you know, the signal. Not just on the cross-section, but also the acceptance, because it varies on parameters at the bottom. Okay. Do you do you envision some structure that? I mean, yeah. So the, the base, uh, like most of run is that you just uh, run the nominal uh, signal. But of course, since it's a parameterized workflow, you can like vary the way that you're generating your signal if you want, right? Because the signal generation workflow is also a separate workflow that you can vary, right? But then you kind of need to adapt your fit a little bit to kind of account for these model specific systematics. So one way is or then you could run recast not only uh, like all the way to the limit, but only maybe to the event selection output, and then you have like your uh, multiple histogram for all your variation, and then you do a custom fit, right? So this will then give you an interface to get to the like fit input with all the variations that you requested, and then you'll do your custom fit if you want. The other part is that, I mean, depends on how you deal with these variations, but a lot of times, you, you only simulate through JOS and everything one, one, one version of that file. A lot of systematics come from varying gen energy scales and 
you know, things, but yeah. I'm just saying if it's one like that, then you can just, that, that can, one of your analysis jobs would have spit out like 50 different, you know, signal history okay. and variations. So, but I mean, the, the, point, the point is, is that when you have a different signal, you may have to have a different yeah. type. So, so we have to modify the workflow based on the signal. Yeah. Like, I think that was the Yeah, the criminal ones are not worried about it. I'm sure they're going to figure out a way to easily yeah. operate that for all signal groups. But I'm talking about that you have to vary some parameter of the model or of the, of the simulation that's not the same for every variable. For example, like you generate uncertainty for your model, right? Exactly. And, and that way you would, would have, so this is basically what I was saying that we can kind of compose different workflows and different signal generation uh, workflows for the same uh, kind of preserved analysis, right? So we can mix and match things. Let's say, so here, for example, we have, like, we have the same analysis component, right? And we have, like, multiple implementations of the signal generation. Let's say you have two generators, right? So you'll then basically have a workflow where this upper part is switched out, right? And this, at the bottom, you'll get two different results, and this will be your variation. Uh, like you one other point, because this this point was brought up about, for instance, if you have some weird signal where there's like long lived particles or something like that, um, uh, where uh, that's a situation where the experiment might decide not to do it because uh, you know, and why why you want a human in the loop essentially in the in the kind of front end back end part because you might think, oh, to get the right answer for this, we're going to actually have to do more work to really assess the systematics here. Yeah. And so we're not going to honor that request. So that was part of the consideration of the sort of uh, how the front end is Right. But even for more standard signals, it may not be as obvious. There might be some more, there might be some human intervention. OK, more questions? Yeah. Uh, I, I know that I need some local system is quite small, but I know that it's important to yeah. So the pachyderm is different in the sense that pachyderm may try to, but I think aim more at uh, kind of, uh, groups that are not like huge 3,000 people collaborations that kind of need a lot of uh, the data management themselves. So pachyderm, they will version the data for them. So they do a lot more than just uh, like this declarative uh, uh, you know, workflow. So they, so this was kind of a little bit like you need more buy in, you know, okay, we'll all use Pachyderm now, right? Instead of, okay, I'll write a text file. Right? So, um, I think it's like there are all, all these workloads with like this trails and all that stuff. And I think um, for high engine physics, it's kind of a barrier um, you know, to have things that are going to buy into these systems. Go on. Yeah. 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 But this, this is more uh, along the lines of okay, forcing everybody to go into one framework, right, which I think. Uh, <laughs> and um, connecting with that, so I guess one of the issues is how do you convince uh, convince three thousand people to make use of this? And um, did you consider uh, recasting that to um, to a method for people to? You know, write the analysis, version it, and so on, and then have it run in parallel automatically. Sort of, you know, how much would it take to to make this sort of a cheap entrance to um, to an analysis in a batch system, say, at a university cluster? So, uh, I mean, this is kind of how we we're positioning this grant. So, there's like this web interface version right. of it, but there are like also a man line API. So, like, so you could, for example, set up a web book to your like repository where it's listening for change that every time you commit to it, it actually runs the entire workflow with caching, okay, we already ran these things and these things need to change. Okay. Right? So that works too. So you were saying it's basically there. I mean it's there, so um, but I mean it's not I mean we're still prototyping this entire Rihanna thing, but I mean it's definitely something that we're thinking about. This prototype something where I get a pull request with the MagGraph file, initiated the entire thing, made a plot, and pushed the result to Zenodo. So I can see it went from a pull request to like a DOI and speak plot and, and uh, all that. Yeah, but especially on a caching scenario thing, right? If you then decide to change the color of Instagram, you don't want to win that, right? Uh, and the other thing is, in terms of buy-in, is that you can then start with an, uh, an experiment to have a kind of a skeleton analysis that you check out as a starting point. It right. already has run super nuts and then you basically start implementing the pieces you need 
in terms of like moving an analysis from last year's data to the next year's data after people graduated? Like, this is obviously going to. So it's also like the question who you need to convince. You definitely don't need to convince the theorists, so they're all very important, right? So if we would do it, they'd be happy. And so that's why we kind of focused on making it easy and like non threatening to define your workflow, right? I mean, it's easy for me to go to like a graduate student and say, okay, can you write something like this, which is like 20 lines of YAML instead of, you know, like learning back in Yeah, but, yeah. You looked at the uh, block pocket, uh, you know, where, where we can use outreach to go away and Yes, so we kind of designed this workflow system also to have as few assumptions as possible, right? So what we kind of presume is that we have a container uh, execution backend and like a shared file system between the nodes. And so the perfect, the perfect uh, use case for HTTP, for example, or Kubernetes, right? So I could have like a Kubernetes cluster on Google Container Engine and using this uh, JSON description, I can just run the workflow there because I've everything up the uh, software and I have data. So things can be interrupted. Yeah, so we are, for example, talking to Google, you know, running some of these workflows, not on certain infrastructure, but on say, Google something else. I have a question regarding the caching, but also the skeleton. Uh, are there plans to have a shared workflow within the collaboration so that uh, there's a, like a base analysis and then different channels or Yeah, so the, there's a thing that so you'll notice if you look a little bit closer. So this is actually like a large JSON document, but we kind of break it up by using these JSON references, which is also kind of industry standard. And so these things uh, can be shared, right? So let's say this could actually be an entire HTTP URL to whatever the common event collection thing. So let's say multiple analysis have the same upstream and something that so they could all share the same JSON fragment for that and then do their custom downstream analysis. And that would also share the final data pack. Oh yeah. And composable so we're yeah, for the works fork and analysis. Yeah. yeah. If you can just check out and say run an analysis, then like let's say I have a car that drives for me, I kind of forget how to do that. maybe there's like some subtle effect since you don't know exactly what's going on under the hood that it's false. But if you're doing it correctly, this analysis pack I mean, uh, I think probably like, uh, you know, if you're a new graduate student, like your job will not be to run these pipelines. Your job is to sort of like probably uh, develop new code that will run in this pipeline. So you not like you'll forget how to write your analysis. Well, I'm just saying it would be tempting for say like you have analysis that's similar to someone else's. Hmm. It would be a lot less work to check out that analysis. Yeah, I mean, so for example, before we would, I mean, there's also like human in the loop before, so it's not like a complete automated system, but it's just a kind of slap out, yeah. right? So there is still like a human in the loop that will check these results, right? And we validate these workflows against, uh, you know, the original analysis results. So there's some kind of check that it's actually doing something sensible, right? And then, I mean, it kind of depends on the collaboration, how much you trust like this specific workflow. I mean, you also run the reconstruction without, I mean, you're trusting the reconstruction software to do it. I think that this is amazing. It's really awesome, but also just an interesting yeah. Okay, so version one still needs brains. Is the web atlas a lot? Um, yeah, this is on behalf of the. <laughs> I like the language, but in principle, we, so okay. like this Rihanna thing is uh, kind of developed as a super. German uh, thing. So we're actually working, so this Cernal House Preservation Portal is in collaboration with like all the four experiments. And so we, for example, ran LHCB workflows together. LHCB, like simulation reconstruction full chain, described in this language, and that we can run on the same infrastructure. But and then we'll have different authentication schemes. Now, if you're, you want to screen your Atlas specific data, you need your Atlas authentication. If you want to screen your Atlas specific data, Okay. Did you also consider talking to uh, other experiments like that too, or even smaller experiments like uh, experiment with neutrinos? Yeah, so, so we were talking a little bit to the neutrino experiments because they had a similar problem of, you know, 
and much less people. Right? And mm -hmm. much less people, and the, the same thing, like the neutrino models might change right. a lot, uh, right. like within years. And so they're interested. So uh, one of these meetings, we actually talked to uh, some of the people. An interesting thing there is we're also talking to like JOT for uh, their validation process and then also when you're talking like uh, the future FCC and things like that and the process of designing the new experiments like you put the workflow in here and your TDR is versioned and, uh, and and if you now instead of doing Bayesian optimization to draw a contour you can imagine doing Bayesian optimization to the detector design because the whole track you know you're comparing two different tracking algorithms and you're sure. or something like that you change the layout of your tracker. Yeah. Any more questions? So um, then that was it, and I'm as sad as you are. This is the end of the session. Um, we'll still have a summary tomorrow, so you can't just go away. Yes. Yeah.